Good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Adams. I am the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Bemis Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, we would love to hear from you in the chat of where you're, um, where you're zooming in from. So please add that when you have a chance. Um, today we are here for I Don't Know You Like That, the Body Work of Hospitality program, um, an artist talk with Heather Dewey Hagbord and Yana Sutella. Um, both artists will be speaking and they will be introduced by Ash Eliza Smith. I will get to that in a second. I'm just going to go through a few slides, some housekeeping, um, and yeah, then we'll get started. So, oh, of course, that always does that. Um, we do have a few programs this week. So it's a busy week here at Bemis. Um, we have Norman Ajari, um, host of the dead Black thought as necromancy, which will actually be happening in person on February 24th at 7 p.m. Um, at the Barbara White's Community Engagement Center um, via the University of Nebraska Omaha. So um, if you are in the Omaha area, please join us for that. And then also we will be streaming that so you can watch that virtually. We also will um, be co-hosting the artist talk with Stephanie Dinkins, who's also an artist in the exhibition on love, data, and technologies rooted in care. That's on Friday evening at 7 p.m. Central at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Mary Ripema, I don't know if I said that right, I'm sorry, Ripema Ross Media Arts Center at the Cooper Theater. So um, we uh, also will be streaming that, but it will be in person if you're in Lincoln or want to um, drive down. <laughs> still, after many years, I still don't know what direction. Just a little south, I think. Um, so uh, we will be there for that as well. It's going to be a wonderful talk. So if you can join us, that would be great. Um, we also have a performance on Saturday night here at Bemis in our performance venue, Low End. We have Tal Sounds, who's be joining us from Baltimore. Um, that is at 8 p.m. So if you are in the mood for some experimental music, please come. Um, it'll be a really wonderful, ex really wonderful performance. Um, we have an, a variety of sponsors to thank for all of the wonderful work that this show has brought us, both um, our exhibition as well as all the programming. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read those out. Um, we have support from the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Can Canada Council for the Arts, um, the Council of Arts and Letters from Quebec, the Humanities Nebraska, Institute Francais, the Nebraska Arts Council with the Nebraska Cultural Endowment, um, Omaha Stakes, as well as University of Nebraska at Omaha Medical Humanities. So thank you all for your support. And then also, if you are interested in supporting Venus, we keep all of our programming free, um, but you can um, help continue to do that by donating at venuscenter.org slash support. Um, please follow us on social media. We are always posting really wonderful things. Um, you can learn more about our upcoming programs. We are bringing back our open house open studios with our current residents on March 5th. There'll be a performance. So lots of things are, are coming down the pike. So please, um, please make sure you're joining us for those things as well. Okay, and now I'm going to introduce you, Ash. <laughs> Um, Ash Eliza Smith is an artist researcher who uses storytelling, world building, and speculative design to shape new realities. With performance as both object and lens, Smith works across art and science, between fact and fiction, and with human and non-human agents to reimagine past and future technologies, systems, and rural urban ecologies. She is an assisting professor, assistant professor of emerging media arts at University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Ash grew up in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina and has worked as a producer, director, performer, and writer for various studios and media platforms. And her research lab within the Carson Center at UNL uses design fiction and narrative to solve problems, reimagine systems, and build worlds. We are super thankful for Ash to be um, our sort of moderator today. Um, and so she will introduce both of our artists and I will stop sharing my screen and let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for the warm introduction. Um, I also wanna thank 
um, Davina Schreier, Jared Packard, Alfredo Amarez Herrera uh, for their assistance today, and to Sylvie Fortin for the invitation to take part in today's discussion. Um, I want to welcome each and every one of you and thank you for joining us today for the final event of the Zoom Artist Talk series accompanying the exhibition, I Don't Know You Like That, The Bodywork of Hospitality. We're delighted you're here and thank you for choosing to share the next hour with us. Today's talk is going to have three parts. Um, first, we're going to hear from Heather Dewey Hagberg, who will share insights into the T3511, uh, the work that's included in this current exhibition at Bemis, and then um, some work currently in development for about 20 minutes. Then Yana Sutala will follow speaking about the work, ideas, and process for about 20 minutes. And the last 15 minutes are reserved for your questions. Um, today's session is being recorded. This includes the chat section. The recording will be published to Bemis's website and Vimeo channel. So please share your thoughts, queries, and comments in that chat, chat section, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Heather Dewey Hagberg, an artist and biohacker who's interested in, in art as research and technological critique. Her work has been shown internationally at events and venues, including the World Economic Forum, Daejeon Biennial, Guangzhou Triennial, Shenzhen Urbanism and Architecture Biennial, Transmediale Berlin, Walker Art Center Minneapolis, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and PS1 MoMA in New York. Dr. Dewey Hagberg is a visiting assistant professor of interactive media at NYU Abu Dhabi, a Sunday Sundance Institute Interdisciplinary Program, Art of Practice Fellow, and an affiliate of Data and Society. She is also founding board member of Digital DNA, a European Research Council funded project investigating the changing relationships between digital technologies, DNA, and evidence, as well as a co-founder, co-curator of Refresh, an inclusive and politically engaged collaborative platform at the intersection of art, science, and technology. You can find more information about Heather and some of her current projects in the chat. So look for some uh, um, links as we uh, uh, move ahead. And um, on behalf of everyone in the audience, I'm delighted to welcome Heather Dewey Heckberg today. All right, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation uh, for the talk today. And of course, for the exhibition. Um, I'm going to start by playing a short excerpt from T3511. Some of you might have seen it since it is in the show, but it'll refresh your memory. And if you haven't visited the show yet, then maybe it will um, excite you to go. So I'll play a, a brief excerpt of that, and then I'm going to talk a bit about where it came from and what the idea was behind this work. Okay, so let's share the screen. A cell is a history, a cell is a home, a cell is a hole, a cell is a cage. A cell is an electric fence enclosing your legible unknown. To break the cell is to trespass the most intimate of spaces. Dear donor T2305, I received five milliliters of your saliva in June. It wasn't hard to get. Using my academic email and mailing address, I simply said it was for research, genetic testing, the truth. When it arrived, I moved it quickly to the freezer to keep it fresh and alive. I sent two milliliters of your fluid for sequencing, and then I waited and waited and waited. Six weeks came and went, and then another time over. The company was experiencing unusually long processing times. When the results finally trickled in six months later, I devoured your profile in a single sitting. You are 46 years old with dark brown eyes, a full head of brown hair, and few freckles. You toss and turn in bed, and you enjoy a savory midnight snack. You like to run, 
for miles, for hours. And this keeps you slim, keeps your heart beating strong, and helps tame your sometimes wild thoughts. You were my first, and I think of you frequently. I imagine your face, your voice, the way you walk. I'm curious where you grew up. I worry for your health. And I wonder what you would think of me poring over your genetic details. I'd like to think you would be flattered, but you might be very angry. Okay, remember the robots. We'll come back to those at the end. Um, I'll have a couple of slides to share with you as I talk about this. So the what you were just listening to, this opening sequence, the first bit of it is a poem, the second bit is a letter. A letter that I wrote to a stranger whose saliva I purchased online just before making the film. The video and the text that I'm reading in the film are part of an artwork called T3511. It's a collaborative project, which I worked on with Toshiaki Ozawa. So artist and a filmmaker. And it's something that I think of as a post-genomic love story, a love story that could only happen in the wake of mass, the massive expansion we've seen over the last 10 years in genomic technologies. The narrative follows a biohacker who becomes increasingly obsessed with this anonymous donor whose saliva she purchases online. And the film is shown either as a single channel or as a four channel video and unfolds as a hybrid um, love letter slash lab notebook that draws the viewer into this emerging world of ubiquitous genomic sequencing, of biobanking, and of commodification of, genetic, of bi human biological materials. And the narrative asks questions about how relationships, family, and day-to-day -day life are likely to change as genetic profiling becomes increasingly commonplace. But the story is not science fiction, and it's not even really speculative. So it's really drawn on uh, hands-on original research that I did. On June uh, 20th uh, of 2016, I believe, I bought a saliva sample from one of a whole slew of companies that sell human specimens online. So this particular one is Lee Biosolutions, uh, but there's many of these companies. And as you can see, there's many different fluids <laughs> available for sale that you can choose between. Um, but I chose saliva for a specific reason because I knew that it was easy to hack because with little to no effort, with no lab required, I could simply take the saliva and pour it into a standard kit purchased in the drugstore for direct to consumer genomic analysis. Probably some of you in the Zoom call have done a 23andMe analysis yourself, or if not, maybe you did Ancestry.com, Family Tree DNA, et cetera. Um, 23andMe is one of the most prominent of a whole uh, slew of companies that have begun offering genetic testing directly to you to the consumer outside of a medical context. So you buy a kit like this for around $100, spit into the uh, tube that you see there, drop it in the mail, and in a month or so, you get an elaborate report detailing your ancestry and genetic traits, um, sometimes your medical um, traits as well. So I took the saliva and I poured it into the tube and I dropped it in the mail. And um, I got back a 23andMe profile, which could tell me, for example, if they have dimples or a bald spot or what their earwax is like, if they like cilantro or um, you know, if they can smell asparagus in their urine. <laughs> so it gave me this lengthy description of what this person might be like. And when I got the data back, I began pouring over it to be honest, I really didn't expect it to work. I didn't expect it to be so easy that I would just take the saliva and pour it in and send it and it would just work like that, but it worked. And I started imagining what they might look like, what they might act like, um, and how they might feel about me analyzing their genetic material. I was able to uh, do a raw data export from 23andMe 
um, and ended up with 600,000 what are called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. They're places in the genome that vary a lot person to person. And using a service called DNA Land, I was actually able to impute or to, um, to make a, an educated guess as to an additional 38 million SNPs from that. So based on knowing 600,000, you can extrapolate from that and guess a whole lot more. And once I have all this data, there's really a lot I can begin to infer about this person. So things, for example, including their health risks. So using a third party site called Prometheus, again, some of you might have used this. Um, you can upload a profile from 23andMe and get a detailed description of a person's genetic likelihood of things like heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, and then other things like musical ability, um, uh, empathy, whether or not you have the so-called empathy gene. So put together all these kind of bits and pieces begin to fit together to create a probabilistic portrait of the stranger just from their DNA, just from literally from their saliva. And this was something that I'd done before. So in 2012, I worked on a project that I called Stranger Visions, where I began collecting cigarette butts and chewed up gum and things like shed hairs and clipped fingernails from streets and uh, waiting rooms and public bathrooms, subways in New York City, extracting DNA from those, um, going to the world's first community biology lab called GenSpace that I just opened up down the street from me in Brooklyn, extracting that DNA, analyzing it, and using that to generate probabilistic portraits of what those strangers might look like based on their genetic information. And they looked something like this. So I would output, kind of algorithmically generate these faces and then output a 3D model that I would then have fabricated in uh, full color at the human scale, so life size. And I would show those alongside the sample, for example, the cigarette butt picture of where it was taken and the complementary information that states what I learned about this person, as well as when and where I collected the sample. So these became probabilistic portraits of strangers based on DNA shed unwittingly in public. what they might look like in an installation. So since I had worked on this project already a few years earlier and could talk more about that, but I also worked on uh, additional projects. So I worked with Chelsea Manning's DNA as well and created multiple portraits of what she might look like based on her DNA while she was in prison. So I was used to working with the stranger's DNA, but this project was of course different. It was personal. So instead of working with a whole panel of anonymous samples, I was just sitting with this one sample. So it's just this one person. So usually here I would have, you know, five, 10 samples that I was working on simultaneously. But here I had this one person and I was just sitting with their data, and just meditating on them, growing attached to this picture that I started to develop of them in my head. And of course it wasn't just their data that I had, it was also their cells. It was literally their fluid. And so I realized this is a really very intimate thing. So in addition to all of the obvious um, issues around privacy, I mean, that the project is meant to invoke, there was this other layer there that was really about asking this question, could you fall in love with someone through their DNA? And what does it mean that we perform these kind of care practices with cells, for example, um, in the laboratory as a kind of everyday practice? And I wanted to take this, this project one step further than I did with Stranger Vision. So rather than creating a portrait of them, I wanted to build on this research I had discovered um, from the scientist, Jenny Ehrlich, who's someone that I've um, been in contact with for a while. He's a very pr provocative scientist. So he likes, you know, I like to ask questions about genetics and society through art, and he likes to ask them <laughs> through science. So he really does very provocative things and um, has a kind of hacker spirit also to his, his science 
And so he showed that it was possible to re-identify allegedly anonymous male DNA donors by correlating their Y chromosome data with publicly accessible genealogy databases. And this was a really brilliant and simple re revelation because the Y chromosomes are handed down paternally. And because in many cultures, last names are also handed down paternally, there's this direct correlation between DNA data and surname, meaning that you can actually use Y chromosome data to make a pretty good guess about someone's last name just from their DNA, which seems magical, but it's actually totally common sense. And they've since expanded on this research and pushed it even, even further beyond just looking at Y chromosome data. And so I wanted to see if I could repeat that experiment in a DIY way, how easy it would be not only to imagine this person based on their genome, but actually to guess who they are. I wanted to predict their last name in addition to appearance and behavior. And so again, I mailed away for a DNA kit. <laughs> really didn't expect this one to work. So it was a cheek swab and I just dipped it in the saliva. And I thought, well, it probably won't work, but it's worth a try. And lo and behold, I did actually get results. So that was a, a really big surprise for me, how easy these systems were to hack. And in the meantime, I wanted to see if I could also successfully culture their cells. So to literally grow this person in a Petri dish. And like everything else in this story, uh, it turned out to be remarkably easy. So I used a filter to sift the living cells from the saliva, drop them into a bath of nutrient media, tuck them into an incubator that set to the temperature of the body. And much to my surprise, they began to divide. And this is what the cells looked like after a couple weeks of growing in vitro. So over the course of months, I began to feel this kind of intense connection to this person, studying their data, growing their flesh, and it became this kind of strange love story. And in reflecting on it then, I realized that it's really the story of all data. So it's about how interpreting data is always narrative, how it's actually always personal. You're always projecting yourself into that data. How it's about this hidden intimacy of lab work, washing cells, feeding them, keeping them warm. And then that it's also about vulnerability. So the vulnerability to surveillance in our genomic time, but also this vulnerability of falling for someone, of opening yourself to the possibilities of love and kind of overlapping these, these vulnerabilities in a strange way. And then it's also about how we piece together clues about other people, how you never really know this other person. And no matter how close you come to them, you're always creating this portrait of them in your head from the clues that they leave behind. So, you know, just thinking about how entering into a relationship, you're kind of piecing together this picture of who you think that other person is. And a lot of that is in your own imagination. So the Y chromosome results came in and to my surprise, I got a perfect match. 37 genetic markers in exact alignment with a name, a geographic location, and a very public Facebook profile. Turning out that they lived in the same city that I bought the saliva from, just a few miles from their lab. So in other words, with very little money or effort, with no special equipment or tools, I was almost certain who this anonymous donor was. And by uh, simply buying their saliva and using easily available commercial services, I was able to re-identify them in a few months. But I'm not going to tell you how the story ends. So if you want to know how the film ends, you have to go see the piece at Venus. The thing that we so easily forget is that these direct-to-consumer services like 23andMe are also social networks. So here you can see from my own profile, my 1,179 DNA relatives. I mean, this enormous network of people that I'm connected with through my genome. The piece also foreshadowed the Golden State Killer case that happened about a year later, um, which was this very, very cold, cold case um, of a serial murderer and rapist who was caught 30 years later when police basically snuck a crime scene sample into an open public genetic genealogy site, quite like what I did, um, but in this case as police, 
and um, use this site that people use to find their relatives or to find their ancestry. And the police uh, basically hacked the site for their own purposes and turned up about 10 to 20 relatives, which they could uh, kind of work their way through and eliminate until they found, indeed, we think, at least the killer through surreptitious DNA testing. Someone who ended up having uh, being the DNA match for the crime scene samples. So that was also kind of an interesting um, connection to something that was just coming around the corner. And then there's the physicality of it all. So this is an installation from the premiere that was at the new art space in Eindhoven. Where we had a four channel installation and here you could see we are sitting inside of the biobank. So this is the connection back to the robots that I mentioned at the end of the film. Um, this image is from the National Biobank in um, Copenhagen, where I shot several scenes of T3511. Before working on the film, I didn't even know it existed, but this robotic freezer that we're looking at has 8 million samples, um, including racks of these small cards that each card has a drop of blood on it. And they have in there <laughs> drops of blood from every baby born in Denmark since 1982. So that's pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy to stand there in this freezer with all of this incredibly sensitive personal data. And each card has a unique ID, which links that blood to the individual that it came from, their data and their medical records. <laughs> so let's just say that there's a lot of questions here around privacy, um, but also about kind of what biomedical data can and, and should be used for. So it's, of course, an incredible data set for research, but it's also an enormous vulnerability. Um, and by its very nature, it invites, we could say, some very biopolitical kind of practices. So sifting and categorizing who's healthy, who isn't healthy, associating genetics with health of certain subpopulations. It's enormously significant and incredibly dangerous. But we can talk more about that. I think it's a very interesting phenomenon, um, kind of the existence of this biobank and, and why did why they invited me in, why I was able to film there um, when most biobanks are pretty closed off from the public. So again, this is not science fiction. This is not the future. This is actually the past. This is 35 years of the past. So that about wraps up what I want to say about T3511. And I would just, in the, in the last few minutes, just briefly switch to uh, work in progress right now. So I'm working on a new film project. It's an expanded installation as well, but to focus in on the film, it is, um, it's called Hybrid. And it's about genetically engineered pigs that are used for xenotransplantation. So used to supply organs for humans, um, in particular, hearts. And to make a long story short, I uh, visited a lot of scientists, did a lot of interviews, shooting in facilities with the pigs, with archeologists looking at the earliest origins of um, domestication. And I created this film by taking the texts from the interviews and kind of reworking them into poetic structures that then became a libretto for an opera. And so what I'd like to play for you now is just a little bit of a sneak peek at some of the footage and you'll hear the composer I'm working with singing and just a draft recording singing the final piece from the, from the opera. It's a short, you could call it a documentary film opera. And um, so I'll just play that for you so you can hear a little bit of the, what the music will sound like and um, see some of the footage. And then I'd be happy to talk more about this project in the Q&A.
So again, that's just a rehearsal recording, and that's the um, the composer is Nick Hallett, and it's a so it's a piece that's composed based on the text from my interviews um, for the film. So there's five acts to it, and yeah, I'm happy to to talk more about that also in the Q and A. So I'll, I think I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Heather. Uh, that was uh, amazing to be brought in on hybrid and excited to talk more about that, but also just really thinking about um, the cell as a world and as a home, as you said, a space for care, vulnerability, privacy, bio biopolitics, um, but yet this int intimacy and love. Um, as a reminder, share your thoughts and questions in the chat and look out for links that could be appearing there. So now I'm honored to introduce Jena Sutela, a Finnish artist based in Berlin who works with words, sounds, and other living media. She engages with both futuristic and ancient materials and audiovisual pieces, sculptures, and performances. Sutela's work seeks to override aspects of culture based on a survival of the fittest narrative in favor of symbiotic relationships between all life forms, both organic and synthetic. Her microbial collaborators include Fizarum, Polycephalum, the mini-headed slime mold with the decentralized nervous system, and the extremophilic Bacillus sutilis natobacterium. Recently, she has also collaborated with artificial neural networks. Sutella's work has been presented internationally at Guggenheim Museum, Bilbao, Spain, Museum of Contemporary Art, Tokyo, Serpentine Galleries, London, Shanghai Biennial, and other locations. Hand it over to you, Jenna. Thank you for the introduction. Just a second, I'll share my screen as well. And thank you, thank you, Sylvie, for the invitation and Heather for the great presentation just now. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to start with a thought from philosopher Yu Kui in the Brooklyn Rail some two years ago. In his essay, The Mystical, Hui compares the ability of AI and data science to show us facts that are hidden, facts that escape the limits of our human senses, to the ways in which the microscope and the telescope once opened up new worlds in front of us. 
He writes, what remains to be asked is, apart from mere facts, what kind of truth will become available to us? In this short talk, I'll share with you some glimpses of my artistic exploration into biological and computational systems. Uh, a lot of my work, um, like the video Holobiont, which is currently on view at, at BIMIS Center, simultaneously zooms out to space and into the gut, looking for connections between these two realms. And much of it uses some kinds of uh, scientific imaging and sonification methods from microscopes to telescopes to artificial neural networks and always to science fictional ends. Um, what you're seeing here is Fissarum polycephalum, uh, the single cell yet many headed species of slime mold on my tongue. Um, this is the organism that first led me on the path of biological experimentation after a training in, in digital or computational art. The, the slime mold is often referred to as the biocomputer and I've ingested it uh, before performative readings, imagining that its hive like behavior is programming my own. Such speech acts can be considered as a form of artificial intelligence. Um, the slime helps me make connections where none previously existed and its movement takes me where I need to go. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna go too deep into this work today, but rather focus on even smaller organisms and, and co-creators that one cannot really see with the bare eye, namely bacteria and um, yeah, embodied cognition. In, in both humans and machines. Um, I'll start from a project called uh, Gut Machine Poetry. It's from 2017. Ever since the Renaissance, the most complex machines that we've developed have been used as the analogy of the mind, but the human mind is intuitive and too complex of an organism to formalize. For example, the head brain works together with the gut brain. Computers are by design deterministic. They follow set procedures. Um, in my project at Machine Poetry, the idea is to introduce entropic processes into computing via inserting fermenting food stuff into the guts of a computer. So I put together a homebrew computer operated by a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast in a kombucha tea ferment and producing a new kind of language. Um, since there were some technical issues with my video clip. This one in specific, uh, what you're looking at here is a still image of a digital microbial poetry culture, which is also kind of sounding actually. <laughs> um, a, a wetware random number generator based on microscopic footage of a, of a SCOBY connected to a series of letters. The stochastic movement of yeast eating sugar affects the jumbling of letters on the screen. And the letters are based on a text about code laws and, and the gut brain axis, uh, my interpretation of an ancient Sumerian incantation dealing with universal language. The word jumbling algorithm connected to the kombucha feed and crafted by Vincent de Belval takes after Jumbo, uh, a program that cognitive scientist and AI researcher Douglas Hofstetter developed to solve anagrams based on the actions inside a biological cell. In his experiment, letters are combined and broken apart by different types of enzymes that, as he describes, jiggle around, glomming onto structures where they find them kicking reactions into gear. Um, in addition to my obsession for kombucha, I also love natto, a sticky Japanese food made from fermented soybeans. Its main ingredient, Bacillus subtilis, is an extremophilic bacterium that has also been used as a survival indicator in spaceflight experimentation. Tolerating physically and geochemically extreme conditions, its spores could have been blown to Earth from another planet by cosmic radiation pressure. Maybe life itself came here in this spore-bearing form. In my 2018 video, Holobiont, I present the natto bacteria as possible distributors of life between the stars, proposing that perhaps it's already all connected. Inspired by the theory of panspermia, literally seeds everywhere, Holobiont suggests that when we coordinate our outer and inner quests, we will find that the so-called alien is in us. Uh, oh, and the term Holobiont, 
after Lynn Margulis, uh, stands for an entity made of many species, all inseparably linked in their ecology and evolution. A Mars rover plays one of the leading roles in the video, and there's a moment when we see the Bacillus subtilis natto bacteria from its perspective through a machine eye. In fact, this is the only way in which we as humans can ever see bacteria via the complex tools of observation and representation that we've devised. Uh, from this perspective, as my friend Benny Wagner once put it, microbes can be considered as completely technological. Um, there's a short trailer. This story is an ancient one, and it is stored inside extremophilic bacteria, resistant to inhospitable environments, protecting it and passing it on to future generations. My work with the extremophilic Bacillus subtilis continued in 2018 in a project titled Nimia Seti. In it, I, I placed the space and bacteria under a microscope and together with an intelligent machine and a few ingenious humans, kudos to Memo Akten and, and Damien Andre, we devised a written and a spoken language based on the bacteria's movements, as well as early ideas of a Martian tongue in an attempt to give it a voice. The machine here was portrayed not only as a spirit medium, but also as an alien of our creation. There's an interesting link between communication with extraterrestrial intelligence and communication with intelligent machines. We might have built some of the, or built the machines ourselves and they work as our interlocutors and infrastructure, but now the challenge is to understand their non-human condition. For example, the so-called black box problem means that it's uh, in machine learning means that it's sometimes hard to explain how an AI has come to its conclusions. The Nimia Seti project has its roots in the seances of the Swiss French medium Helen Smith, who in the late 19th century claimed she could communicate with Martians. Her Martian language is actually considered as one of the first documented forms of glossolalia or speaking in tongues or vocalizing speech like syllables that lack any readily comprehensible meaning. In Smith's time, astronomers equipped with early low resolution telescopes believed that they had discovered canals on the red planet, thereby bringing to public attention the idea that Mars might be habitable. Uh, by the early 20th century, improved astronomical observations revealed that the canals had been nothing more than scratches on the telescope's lens. Contemporary high resolution mapping uh, of the surface of Mars shows no such features. Another kind of technologically mediated truth has become available to us. My video shows a computer watching footage of the Bacillus subtilis bacteria, probably the most likely Martians, uh, under a microscope and, and generating a script or calligraphy based on an analysis of what it sees. Imagine a pen suspended from a long piece of string resting on paper that's slowly sliding sideways. Uh, raw force from the movements of the bacteria knocks the pen around, leaving marks on the paper. Audio interacts with the bacterial movements, and what you hear is the computer re reorganizing or mimicking the early Martian language. A network trained on my voice looks at each frame of the video and produces a short block of sound that it thinks matches that frame or the configuration of bacteria in it. And another layer of sound, the so-called vocals, uh, presents a more typical approach where the network simply generates more of what it has heard before. 
let's watch a few um, excerpts. <laughs> my work looks at or looks for the ghosts in the intelligent machines of our creation that are increasingly shaping our reality. On the one hand, the work is about getting in touch with the non-human condition of the computers around us. And on the other hand, it's about the computers getting in touch with the more than human world around them. Uh, and another focus are the invisible life forms that govern our lives, you know, when zooming in, there's all that extreme loving bacteria that can be seen swarming in our microbiomes that plays a role in the course of our health and well being, as well as our thoughts and emotions, essentially making us who we are or speaking through us. Uh, most recently, I've been making some material experiments with bacteria and their foods. More specifically, I'm looking into the mind manipulating properties of human milk or human milk oligosaccharides, HMOs. These sugars in breast milk that seem to shape the early development of babies' nervous systems through feeding their gut microbes. So it's the gut-brain connection in, in action. And, and not only babies, but there are all these HMO-based supplements being developed to enhance adults' gut health too. Uh, in this picture, I'm actually glazing these gut floral reliefs with human milk. Um, this is a forthcoming work that also uses dung, an ancient building material, as its base. Without going into too much detail about this work, I'll just mention that it comes from a fascination towards bacterial therapies and particularly their proposed mental effects. The idea that we can accommodate the bacteria of others through things like fecal transplants and, and feel better mentally. Uh, perhaps this is a good point to stop since there's not so much time and, and just to say that an important Part of my project is to acknowledge ourselves as a community of organisms, um, the human body as um, a fluid assemblage of metally life forms interacting at multiple scales, as Sylvie wrote um, so nicely in the description for the BIMI show. Uh, I believe that understanding oneself as interconnected with the wider environment marks a profound shift in subjectivity, one beyond anthropocentrism and, and individualism. And we shouldn't forget all the artificial machinic forces at play. Um, to go back to the quote from uh, Yukui in the beginning, while we approach our multi-species existence with and through different technologies, um, we should continue asking that apart from mere facts, uh, what kind of truth and also whose truth is becoming available to us. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Um, all right, I'm going to jump right into questions because there is a lot. Um, I'm trying to summarize some of what I see in the chat right now. So I'll start with a few and then uh, um, we'll take it from there. So the first question for you both is about this terrain between what is considered nature and what is considered technology. Has your ideas about this relationship shifted at all through your work? And how does the, this, these ideas of host, hospitality, hostility, some of the themes that are a part of this current show intersect with those ideas about nature and technology? Uh, 
I can certainly start. <laughs> um, so I think my ideas about this topic are always changing. It, it feels to me like something that I'm always learning more and kind of rethinking. And, um, and so I hope that my work is about probing that and trying to learn more about what we see, why we want to draw that distinction, you know, and whether, whether that makes sense that there's a distinction there at all, how useful is that to us now? So I'm always kind of rethinking about this, this nature technology divide and thinking about like, how do you complicate that? And then what, how, what work does that, that, does that division do for us right now? Um, and so I think definitely in both of the works that I shared with you, you can see this kind of melding, melding of the technological into the personal and into something that might seem immediately like it's opposite into something that is very, um, we, we often think of technology as being digital technology and being very abstract and distant and um, cold and think much less about the, the kind of biotechnologies and the ancient technologies. I mean, like what Yena is, is talking about in her work as well around these ancient technologies that are um, very physical, you know, that are not necessarily having anything to do with, with anything digital. So I think it just, it puts it into an interesting perspective and can get us to ask about where we draw these lines and why we feel the need to. Yeah, and I think it was interesting. You also addressed the the sort of um, the layer of interpretation that goes into into um, processing data or or what I often um, uh, sort of think about while while working with things like like microscopes or or neural networks or something that. That there's so much mediation going on, and and there's so much interpretation going on, and and of course these things are so interconnected um, that uh, that you you cannot you cannot see <laughs> like uh, within or or without like like into the gut or or to outer space without some sort of technology in between. So so they're very interlinked. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm trying to summarize a lot of what's being asked and uh, there's a lot of science questions coming in. So I'm gonna go to that um, after this next question um, because I actually think that um, what also unites both of your work is, um, is uh, yes, the science and the artistic inquiry into the science. However, it becomes more accessible and compelling through the ability to tell stories or um, you know, in some ways, world building. Um, and I guess I'm curious how performance or embodiment is a part of that storytelling process or how do you, where does that storytelling component come in um, at, at what stage of the research? I can, or do you wanna go? For yeah, that? no, please feel free to start. <laughs> no, just that I feel like there's so much uh... Or narrative and and this kind of fiction plays such a big role in in my work that it's often like an there is like often a scientific process uh, involved at some point uh, or often a lot of works maybe start from some sort of assumption and then continue with a visit to a lab <laughs> and then then continue with like this edit <laughs> of like what is communicated that often then has a layer of, of fiction in included, but um, so it's a lot about kind of assuming, then learning, then sort of interpreting or, or further sort of uh, narrativizing in my case. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. So I think for me also, my work usually starts with some kind of research question and then I'm on this kind of journey to understand and to explore it and collecting these artifacts along the way, which might be stories, which might be physical things, outcomes of experiments, things like that. And then 
you, I never know in the beginning what is going to come out. I mean, what the piece is going to be. That is very much through the process. And uh, writing is is definitely a, a part of my practice as well. So I really enjoy, you know, some days just spending time uh, on the the writing part, which might go in more of a narrative direction or a poetic direction or or a different, you know, non-fiction direction. Operatic. Um, but I always, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always like to have writing as, as part of it. It helps me work through the ideas. And sometimes that makes it into the piece. But it, I think it depends very much on also what it is and how one can draw people into it. Because sometimes we're dealing with things that are invisible or, or are almost hard, you know, really, really difficult to make visible. And stories can really draw us into imagining those things and imagining the, the impact of those things. Um, so yeah, I think that's maybe I'll leave it with that. So a lot of the questions um, coming in are about this, um, you know, uh, to summarize, because there's quite a few of them, but um, you know, either artists interested in entering into the scientific space, how does that happen? Um, or how does one learn about more things about um, biotechnology, AI, et cetera? So I'm gonna to try to summarize that into a question here um, that might be generative for y'all. Um, so I think that working at uh, the intersection of art and science is another kind of hospitality or anytime you're kind of um, inside of a lab with a scientist and vice versa. Um, because you're kind of bringing in one another's methods and research and inquiries. So I guess maybe just uh, how do you, what are some of your strategies for enabling um, these kinds of projects to happen? Um, you know, how, where, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I can start with that one. Um, so the first strategy that I had, and this relates to the question about kind of like how to start so I got started through this community lab called GenSpace in Brooklyn. And there's a lot of those labs now. So if you're interested in getting involved in molecular biology and biotechnology, don't know where to start, you might start by looking for one of these community labs. And there's a website called DIY Bio that lists a lot of these um, labs that are open for anyone to come in and take a class and learn a lot of these basic things. That was my entry point, was taking one of these crash courses where I learned about doing DNA work. And then I worked under the mentorship of the scientists there on my first project. And that kind of has led me in many different directions from then. So since then, I've worked with lots of different scientists in different kinds of institutions, ranging from academic to uh, more corporate. And it's just, it's always a really fascinating experience I think as long as you go into that really wanting to learn, you know, not not necessarily having something that you are expecting directly from the scientist or something like that, but that you are also interested in, in understanding how, how they see their work and, and what the daily work consists of and kind of almost ethnographically, I guess. Um, so I've always found that to be a really rewarding experience and, some, and a very generative one. And um, one of the uh, most recent residencies that I did was also was, was in a lab. It was actually in a virology lab, interestingly, before COVID. <laughs> I was working on a virus project before COVID. And we had such an interesting time there. And um, the scientists at the end of it said that he'd never thought about the social political implications of, the, of his work before. And for him, it was like this incredible experience to suddenly realize that what he did every day had these bigger implications that there were these possibilities these futures that were that he was not seeing and that was just fantastic for me that was like the best <laughs> that was the best art science collaboration moment for me of realizing like wow i inspired someone to think about the meaning of their work in a new way so that was pretty great I, f I think um, where well, originally I kind of, uh, as mentioned, like like somehow the Pizarro and Policia film, the slime world was my 
my my, my gate theory to 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 science scientific experiments but it really came from i guess my interest in like cyberpunk like science fiction and then finding this really <laughs> interesting sort of natural computer and then using art as an excuse to get into a science lab basically to begin with um and and i i um found found out about a few labs that were doing interesting robotics and mapping experiments around the Fisarum in, in Japan and visited them. And then um, that sort of brought about this, this kind of uh, line of work originally. And then, like you mentioned, I also did some residencies later that sort of allowed uh, the access <laughs> to the lab and some time therein um, so that I feel like seems to be like a really good good strategy to be able to do something like that. Um, thank you both. Um, and it seems like we do have a lot of scientists here today and are interested in this. So uh, please uh, open your labs, let us artists in. Um, and there are also a lot of very personal kind of uh, questions about things that I'll let you all answer in the chats after um, we hop off. But I think maybe one more question um, just because of the time we're at the top of the hour, but um, since you gestured to this a second ago, Heather, about kind of discussing hybrid a little bit more, um, there are some questions that want to know in those first interviews that you did, what have you learned about human pig inter um, actions? from the first interviews you've done? Yeah, I mean, the question that I went into this project with kind of the research question, one of them at least was, is CRISPR gene editing for this purpose? Is this a rupture or is this a, co a continuation of our many millennia long process of domesticating and you know, selective breeding with pigs? And so that, that's been kind of my focal point in the work, which is why I have archaeologists in there as well. And these ancient bones is kind of thinking through this question, because this is often something that comes up in discussions with molecular biologists about, um, about genetic engineering is this idea that it has this really long history, that there would be something continuous happening there, um, along with our history of selective breeding. And so, so this was the main thing that I went to, into it kind of really focused on and thinking like, are we in a way reconnecting this tree of life, you know, by bringing these creatures that uh, millions of years ago split off in terms of our um, evolutionary history. Now we bring them a little bit closer together. And so I asked actually everyone these questions and, um, most people would would start by saying that it is a continuation, that there is uh, something very similar happening uh, in the act of doing genetic engineering, even in doing CRISPR. But then kind of after that initial statement would go to the next step and say, you know, but it is also radically different. <laughs> so it's kind of both, you know, almost everyone had kind of the same answer, differently uh, spoken. And so it does, I think I can conclude from that, that there is something incredibly new happening here that we're still trying to characterize. What is the potential? Um, what kinds of things might, might come out of these, these new processes that are so much more efficient, so much faster, that enable you know, massive um, and very precise changes in the genome to, to happen. So, that has been kind of my focal point, um, although the film project also, of course, explores these questions of ethics and you can't really think or talk about these things without thinking about these, uh, these questions of like power relations and, um, and the long, long relationship, of course, also of eating meat. How does that relate to um, this form of work? Because uh, in particular, the three countries that are doing the most work in xenotransplantation are Germany, which is where I did a lot of the shooting, China and the US. And these are also the main pork eating countries of the world. So <laughs> there's a big, you know, uh, reason. There's a reason why it's, um, why that research comes from there um, and not so much, for example, from where I'm sitting right now in, in Abu Dhabi. So 
So this is a not a pork eating country. And it's a place where this kind of research has a different cultural meaning and um, debate. So anyway, that's just a little bit, a little bit about it, but hopefully that answers some of the questions. All right, um, we're a little bit over, but I want to thank Yena Sutila and uh, Heather Dewey Hagberg for your time today and just really fascinating and amazing talks. Uh, Sylvie Fortin for organizing us all together here and uh, thank you all Bemis. And um, there are lots of great uh, chat, uh, questions in the chat um, and some links. So um, I think everything will be is recorded and available for download. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude this session. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. It was really nice. Thank you.